All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, just a few people in the room today for today's seminar, but we've got uh, quite a few people joining us online. Welcome to uh, this MSDI research seminar series. Uh, this is a usual space for us to share our research or knowledge that we generate at the Institute, but we also regularly have uh, talks from people across Monash, um, across the university, across uh, Australia, and also international. And I'm really pleased that today we've got an international speaker who will I will introduce in a minute. Hi, Stefan. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Rob Raven. I'm the research director at MSDI. And um, yeah, I'm, um, I would also like to say that this is a joint seminar with business and economics. So uh, we occasionally have these seminars together with uh, other faculties if there's a shared topic of interest. Um, and in this case, it's with the faculty of business and economics and we're grateful for uh, joining us. Um, so before I continue, I'd like to pay my respect to the traditional owners and the traditional custodians of the land that we're based on, the people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and pay my respect to the elders past and present. So very pleased that today we've got um, Julian Kircher, um, Associate Professor at Roskilde University here to uh, speak to us about the circular economy. Uh, Julian has a PhD in geography uh, at um, the University of Oxford. Um, and you also hold positions at Cambridge University, um, and your main position, I think, is at Roskilde University in, in Denmark, and you're at Utrecht University, this, this is where we've met the first time, um, I recall, uh, many years ago. And um, this is all a side job for Julian, his real job is actually to be a partner at McKinsey, so it's quite impressive, the amount of work you uh, managed to uh, put into um, the seven days that you've got, and hopefully also have a bit of a weekend. Um, so Julian is well known for his work on uh, the circular economy. He's written many highly cited papers on this. Um, and what I really like about your work, Julian, you also don't shy away from controversial uh, statements. I remember one paper on the, the bullshit in the sustainability and transitions literature um, that um, I welcome these kind of debates in the, in the literature very much. So um, Julian is here for the whole week. Um, some of you might also see him tomorrow when we have our um, second MSDI affiliates event. Um, if you haven't registered for that yet, you can still do so and join us for the online parts um, of that event. Now, before handing over to Julian, I would like to uh, just um, share some practicalities. So Julian will speak for about 35 uh, minutes. Um, then there's room for Q&A. Um, we've got people in the room, but also online. May we'll keep an eye on what's happening in the chat. If you have a question, uh, please let us know. I prefer you to speak yourself, to read to read your question yourself, to say the question yourself. Uh, but if you can, for instance, yeah. I don't know if you're caring for children or other things that uh, don't allow you to put up your camera or speak out loud, please do let us know and we can also read the question for you. All right, with that, Julian, the floor is yours. Excited to be here. First time for me in Australia. And um, yeah, very excited to share a bit of the research that I'm currently doing that I've done in the past couple of years on circular economy. And um, I brought, in essence, a bit of a collection of what I'm working on, of what I've been working on. It's going to be a bit of a power through the next uh, 35 minutes, structured um, basically along three big buckets. Bucket number one, uh, the circular economy as such. Um, what is it even? Uh, one of my first uh, research contributions in the field, I'd say, um, a couple of years ago, also when I met Rob Raven at the Utrecht University. Second, I'll talk about my work around circular startups that I consider to be the most promising avenue these days when it comes to uh, transitioning to the circular economy. And then I brought a third bucket um, that I put under the buzzword of circular disruption, where I'll essentially talk about um, what is needed in terms of enablers, in terms of policy uh, to bring those young circular ventures, the circular startups uh, to life and to scale most importantly. So that's a bit of the plan for the next 30, 35 minutes. Um, yeah, and, and let me start with um, one key message that is, um, if you look into this vastly growing field of uh, sustainability research, I'd argue that for a couple of years, actually, circular economy has been uh, the biggest buzzword out there, right? And you see this if you just plot basically um, Scopus articles for uh, different core terms related to sustainability um, on, uh, on on a timeline, sustainable development, sustainability transitions, uh, where Rob is doing a lot of work, industrial ecology, and you really see that none of these 
um, uh, reach the same level of kind of like growth um, as circular economy. If you compare it to the field of sustainable development, it's still much, much smaller, but I'd say arguably it's the one subfield within this broad field of sustainable development that's really gotten uh, the most attention. Now, and when I started my academic uh, career, 2017, at Utrecht University, um, I was also very excited to jump into the field of circular economy. I'd actually worked on hydropower dams uh, during my PhD. However, um, the back then dean at Utrecht University uh, shared with me that there is no uh, dams in the Netherlands, and thus I would need to find a second research topic. And I settled on a circular economy. Yeah, and um, in the early days of me kind of like diving into the academic literature, I found that there was a lot of interesting stuff being written about the circular economy but the one core realization was that despite reading dozens of dozens of papers i couldn't really catch what people actually meant by the term and it felt to me as if nobody had properly defined the term and that maybe also um many people writing about it actually mean meant many different things while still using the same word so the very first paper i wrote on circular economy uh, was the paper you see here on the left conceptualizing the circular economy, an analysis of uh, 114 definitions, where basically I took the attempt to map out what do people in the literature actually mean when they talk about circular economy, is there some kind of consensus? Um, it's a paper I've just updated. I felt it's a good time to update it uh, after five years, uh, conceptualizing the circular economy, revisited an analysis of 221 definitions. And indeed, um, as I'll now showcase to you, what I found is that back in 2017, there was a lot of disagreement actually on what the circular economy even means. There's still quite a bit of disagreement today. However, the good news is that some consolidation has, uh, has taken place. Now, um, let, me, let me share a bit of what's in this paper with the 221 definitions. And let me share a bit, uh, not because um, I'm saying you, you're not familiar with circular economy, but I feel that even those who say they've researched the circular economy for many, many years still have a lot of uh, nuance and uh, delta in how they actually understand the term. Now, um, my colleagues and I, for this paper on the 221 definitions, we actually this time looked at a superset of almost 7,000 articles, all published since 2017. And then we drew what we um, say is a representative sample um, of these 7,000 articles, 364 articles, um, 221 that actually specify what circular economy means. And we looked in these 221 articles to figure out um, what are the big debates when it comes to defining the circular economy, but also what's the common core, right? So what is it that people all agree on? Now, and the, the, the first key takeaway in terms of what is the circular economy is that most definitions um, have three big elements in these definitions. One is around the core principles of the circular economy. You've probably heard about the 4R framework. There's also the 10R framework, the 9R framework. Doesn't even matter how many Rs, but um, almost every definition will have some of these Rs in there. For sure, the recycle, but ideally also the reduce and the reuse, right? So these kind of like core principles are one, I'd say, fundamental bucket of what people mean when they talk about the circular economy. A second fundamental bucket, by the way, much more present, as I show in a minute, than uh, back in 2017, is the bucket of aims, right? So circular economy, to many who write about it, is not an end in itself, but it's a mean to an end. And many actually say, Martin has written the most famous paper on this, that it's um, a means towards sustainable development, right? It's a vehicle to get you towards sustainable development. And there's a bit of disagreement in the literature if uh, the triple bottom line, all elements of um, sustainable development are to be reached by a circular economy. But for sure, there's this notion in almost all of the definitions that circular economy is there to achieve something beyond circular economy. And the last but not least, a lot of the definitions also touch upon what we called enablers of the circular economy. And again, here, if you look at the 221 definitions, there's nuance. Not everyone agrees on what are the core enablers, but there's uh, almost everyone talking about some of the enablers, such as um, businesses, business models, such as consumers, such as policies, such as also technologies, right? So these kind of like three buckets are something I'd say where to some extent you'll find this in most of the 221 detergents. Um, given 
um, that uh, there's only 35 minutes. I now not walk you through all of the 2021 definitions, but just showcase you a bit more of like what is it that we that we found in this paper when we went through. And let me actually deep dive into the second pillar that I just showcased, which are the aims of the circular economy, where I find there's some interesting results, specifically when you compare how people understood circular economy back in 2017 to how they understand it today. Back in 2017, actually only 11% of definitions had something in there that was explicitly related to sustainable development. So back in 2017, actually what I previously said, um, circular economy is a means to an end was something that only 10% of scholars would largely agree. There was much more of a discourse around circular economy is an, is an end in itself. Um, there was a lot of debate in the past five years, and what we see is this has really changed. So the term sustainable development is now mentioned in one third of the circular economy definitions. It's much, much more of a consensus. And if you actually break it down into the triple bottom line, you see that roughly half of the definitions, they talk about circular economy bringing in some kind of economic prosperity. And they also talk about circular economy bringing some kind of um, environmental quality. What's a bit different, what's a bit interesting is also that there's quite a bit of uh, debate right now on also decoupling economic growth, right? So there's, uh, I'd say majority of scholars saying it's about economic prosperity, but there's also some scholars beginning to challenge that and say, hey, actually, um, do we need economic prosperity? And couldn't there also be um, a world where the circular economy in the end leads to an economy that's that's uh, smaller from a GDP's perspective than before? But I think this is an interesting development, much, much more conversation now in uh, the literature that circular economy is there to, um, to serve basically sustainable development. What I also particularly found interesting is that there's more discussion around social equity, whereas I'd still say this remains um, underexplored in sustainability to transitions literature. There's this, um, I'd say, rapidly growing research field around um, the just transitions. I think it's something some circular economy of scholars have uh, started to pick up. There's this uh, debate around circular justice, circular society, but it's still something uh, at the early stages. And what I also particularly liked is that now 10% of definitions actually talk in their definitions about what does circular economy mean for future generations. Back in 2017, we only found this in a single definition and we said, well, this seems very odd, right? I mean, you should uh, consider this a lot more. And as you see, um, roughly 10% of definitions now do this. Now, this is a bit of, um, as an example of a bit of a meat in the paper of what we found basically when we looked at all of, this, all of these definitions. And obviously, if you go through the gruesome task of uh, running through 221 definitions, you cannot stop yourself from them proposing the 222nd definition, which is exactly what you what you find here on the slide. Um, before I read it out, um, it's important to note that this is not meant as the kind of like one and only the true definition of circular economy, but it's in essence just trying to capture our coding framework, right? Trying to capture the different themes we found in the different definitions. So in a sense, it's a it's a meta definition that doesn't claim to be any truer than any of the other definitions, but that tries to capture important themes in the discourse, right? And because it tries to capture all of these different uh, themes in the discourse, it's also quite lengthy. It's not as elegant as the definition, for instance, that Martin put out a couple of years ago, but it's also not meant to be elegant, right? It's meant to capture all of these different themes. So let me quickly read it out. Um, the circular economy is a regenerative economic system which necessitates a paradigm shift to replacing the end of life concept with reducing, alternatively reusing, recycling and recovering materials. Those are the core principles throughout the supply chain with the aim to promote value maintenance and sustainable development, creating environmental quality, economic development and social equity. So really the triple bottom line to the benefit of current and future generations. It's enabled by an alliance of stakeholders, industry consumers, policymakers, academia, and their technology innovations and capabilities. This is our you could say somewhat clumsy definition of the circular economy, but in a sense, as I said, it's meant to be clumsy because it just wants to capture these different themes of the discourse. And obviously not everything we put here is in all of the 221 definitions, but this is basically what we found as kind of like core themes that were that were worth, worth capturing. Um, let, me, let me showcase two more slides in this section of, uh, of what, is the, what is the circular economy. Um, one slide is on a on a forthcoming paper of a, a good friend of mine and a frequent co-author, Chris Hartley and myself, which um, calls the circular economy um, a magic concept. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with 
this literature around uh, magic concepts actually comes from public policy literature, where public policy scholars were just fascinated by the fact that it seems that some buzzwords, some, some concepts just become buzzwords, and they're so sticky and everybody uh, talks about them, and they try to understand why, why that's the case. And I actually think um, this magical concept notion is a wonderful notion to also explain why circular economy, my first slide I showed you, is uh, so incredibly successful these days. Huh? The, the folks who talk about magic concept define magic concept by um, four dimensions. First, they say there's a high degree of abstraction, which I think for sure is true for the circular economy concept, given how many different definitions are out there. I think it uh, very much showcases that the circular economy is this putting on the wall that you can't really kind of like uh, put your hands around. Second, they say there's a huge aspirational or normative orientation, which again, I think is very true when it comes to circular economy and this uh, possible notion of being a new uh, sustainability paradigm, as Martin has said. Third, there's this claim that uh, it can dissolve previous dilemmas, right? And uh, we've seen many of these sustainability concepts before, industrial ecology, biomimicry, the green economy, that all haven't been able to do it. And now there's this new promise out there that the circular economy can suddenly do it. And it's very mobile across domains, right? And this is the practitioner domain, uh, the scholarly domain. Within the scholarly domain, it's uh, being researched in so many different subfields. So I think it really nicely fits these uh, characteristics of a, of a magical concept. And as my co-author, Chris Hartley, and I put out in, in our paper, is I think this, to some extent, maybe explains why this concept is so so sticky and um, why it's maybe also more sticky than some of the concepts that we've seen before. That being said, my personal conviction is that I think there's this there's a magical concept in the realms of sustainability research coming around every couple of years. Huh? And I think in a sense, you could also say it's a bit it's a bit sad because I feel there's a, always a new magical concept that everyone jumps upon. And then after a couple of years, there's disillusionment that also this magical concept hasn't been as magic as people thought. And then people kind of like move on. But uh, still, I think it's a it's a nice way to think about why uh, circular economy as a concept um, catches the imagination of of so many now. Let me share a let me share a final slide, very wordy slide on uh, the relevance of all of this uh, definitions work. As Rob mentioned, I'm a bit of a hobby epic academic, so actually four days of my week I do um, different stuff than academia. I uh, work in in management consulting, so I, I call myself a pre-academic, but I'm probably much more a practitioner than academic. And when my friends in practice see some of this definitions work I've done, uh, they always challenge and at times tease me, right? And they say, Julian, how can you write uh, such papers? What's the what's the relevance, right, of just looking at 221 definitions of the circular economy, then coming up with the 222nd? Is this really um, relevant work or is this not really kind of like the, the ivory tower work that you yourself so often criticize, right? Well, my sense and my conviction is actually that I think this kind of work um, is quite important, right? Because if you think about really bring the circular economy to live in practice, I think it's very fundamental that you actually have a shared understanding of what circular economy means. Otherwise, cumulative knowledge development is uh, incredibly difficult. And I think we've seen, especially in the early years of circular economy, that a lot of people have not really reflected upon what the term means. And there have been a lot of papers that for themselves were quite interesting, but that really didn't build upon each other and also couldn't build upon each other because they were using similar language, similar terminology by and substance, actually not meaning the same, right? So I, I do think that at perfunctory first sight, um, this debate around what does circular economy even mean seems a bit academic, ivory tower, it's easy to mock it, but I think um, it is a very foundational debate in order to make sure that this field actually, um, yeah, allows for cumulative knowledge development and allows um, for, real, uh, for real progress. So much on chapter one, what is the circular economy and uh, why does it matter? And I'll move into more, even more practical terrain now, uh, which is the topic of, of circular startups. When I started researching the circular economy back in 2017, I jumped number one on what does the circular economy even mean? But I also jumped number second um, in this literature around circular business models. And back in 2017, there was a real, I'd say bias almost in this literature to look specifically at incumbent companies, right? So there was these kind of like examples of large 
companies um, in Germany and Europe that allegedly went uh, circular. Adidas, for instance, that brought out this um, shoe that was 100% circular, or Philips that was suddenly renting light instead of uh, selling bulbs, right? In a sense, it was always um, the same kind of examples. And if you actually uh, double clicked on these examples, you'd oftentimes find that uh, there were great narratives, great stories, but they, they were actually only a tiny part of the entire business and that for sure there was not a circular transition happening in these large incumbent companies but it was just uh, yeah oftentimes not even a full product line that was being being put out there so uh, my colleagues at utrecht university and i we looked around and we said okay isn't there also some companies out there that are actually not just less than one percent circular but that are 100 percent circular and they may still be very small but maybe there's a way to kind of like grow them and maybe that's actually a viable pathway to a circular economy so what we did back in 2017 is we started to look into circular startups uh, back then nobody was using the term circular startups and uh, my very first phd student back then and i we actually wrote a paper proposing the term of circular startups many have picked it up by now and we started building a database um, we've just extended it where we try to just catalog we just try to map um, startups in uh, Randstad area and area around Amsterdam in London and in Berlin that we would uh, consider uh, circular startups and indeed many of these founders themselves branded themselves of circular economy startups and they said we're trying to launch companies here that are doing nothing but pushing the circular economy and when we looked at these startups we found five types of startups um, that basically together make up um, circular startups design-based waste-based platform-based service-based and nature-based startups and let me uh, just quickly walk through these categories because i think it gives um, it makes a lot more concrete of what it means to be a circular startup but it also explains how wide the spectrum basically of, of business models is so design-based startups are basically those that have a design innovation that tries to um, improve uh, the material footprint of a product, right? So a good example here is a car tent. They sell festival tents, but they're entirely made from cardboard, which obviously is a lot more sustainable than your typical kind of like plastic uh, festival tent. The second example, a very obvious example, is a waste-based startup. A good example here is Refill. They basically do, um, they develop fully recycled 3D printing filaments from car dashboards or old PT bottles. So they take waste and they basically yeah, make it in a, um, a new product that can be used in a variety of instances again. Platform-based startups are the ones that we've seen are most exciting for uh, venture capital because they scale very well. Good example here, Access Materials Exchange, basically a platform that allows you to track materials and to basically have a history of different materials. Very important when you go into circularity. A fourth one, actually founded, uh, co-founded by a, a professor at Maastricht University, Nancy Bocken, uh, many of you may have heard about her service-based startups. Um, Homey is an example of uh, paper-use washing machines, right? So you offer um, uh, you offer something that used to be purchased, such as a washing machine. You start offering this as a service. And then last but not least, nature-based uh, startups. So Rotatswan, I think, a great example that uh, produce oyster mushrooms from uh, coffee waste, right? So these are five examples of circular startups. Um, 750 of those we found back in 2017. Uh, by now, we've expanded the database and we found across 3,000 of these startups now. Uh, so it's really something where you can, I think, arguably say there's a huge bus and there's a huge movement in, in Europe. We still have to say, though, that when we look at the development stage of these uh, circular startups uh, compared to conventional startups, um, they tend to be more at an early stage. I mean, uh, per definition, every startup is at early stage. But if you think about kind of like the different phases a startup goes through from the perspective of a venture capitalist, you see that uh, yeah, even more circular startups are the seed stage, early growth stage. Um, they oftentimes um, yeah, um, struggle or have struggled in the past to convince also funders of why this is a viable business model. However, and this is um, one of my, I'd say, newest research streams right now when it comes to circular business models. What I've been very excited about in the past two years is that we've actually seen a couple of these circular startups move to the stage of scale-ups, right? And scale-ups typically I define as a startup company that has been able to raise at least 20 million in venture capital funding, right? Which completely changes the game for you as a startup because suddenly you are, uh, yeah, you can invest a lot more in marketing and R&D. It just allows you to put yourself on a completely different trajectory. And we've seen a bunch of these uh, startups now across Europe. I brought four example here, four examples here. 
Um, one I frequently use myself, it's uh, based in Berlin. A good friend of mine is the head of sustainability there. Uh, it's called Grover. Um, they raised uh, 71 million in venture capital back in 2021. And basically their idea is that you should not own electronics any longer, such as your iPhone, you should just rent it, right? So you can uh, rent uh, your iPhone. I've also rented this iPhone here from uh, Grover. It costs you a couple of bucks uh, per month. And then at some point, once you don't want to use it anymore or it breaks, you can bring it back and they will refurbish it and uh, rent it to someone else, right? So it really extends the lifetime of, of many, many products because oftentimes if you own it after two or three years, you say you don't like it, you will just give it away. But here the model is you just give it back to Grover and they will find a new customer for an older iPhone, uh, maybe a customer that has uh, less willingness or ability to pay for this. So it's a, I think it's a great business model, really extending the, the product lifetime. Second great business model, and that also showcases a bit the troubles that circular startups, circular scale ups are still in is a twig. Actually, my very first PhD student, uh, Marvin Henry, with whom I built this initial database on circular startups, he uh, then moved after the PhD to twig and he worked for twig also as their head of sustainability. Sad news about twig is uh, they've just gone bust, right? And we've seen this also with a couple of circular startups, circular scale ups. In a sense, it's normal for a startup also to go bust for a scale up as well. but. When we look into the data, I'd still say the frequency of the circular version of the startup going bust still is higher than for the for the linear one. And Twig, um, it's a bit of a sad story, but let me first share about like what was their business model idea, which I think was a was a beautiful idea. Basically, their observation in terms of pain points on the market was that they said a lot of people want to resell their used items, but it's too too much work basically for them to like throw it in the market. And oftentimes reused items will not get you a lot of revenue. So uh, people just don't bother uh, to resell, although they could. So Twig said, well, let's make it as easy as possible to resell a used item. So their idea or their basically technology was that they said, um, if you have an electronic goods or if you have a textile good, um, for instance, I used it for um, uh, my child's um, cloth. You can just, with the app of Twig, you can take a picture and Twig will tell you what's the value of this. So it'll tell you your old iPhone is still worth $150, or it will tell you uh, this trousers of this uh, four-year-old, uh, they're still worth $11. And then they will take a picture and then you can accept their estimate of how much it's worth. And once you click accept, immediately the money will be transferred to your bank account. And the next day, someone from UPS will come and will pick it up. So it just makes it incredibly easy to sell your reused goods, right? I mean, I used to kind of like sell my used goods on like eBay. I'm sure if you also use that in uh, in Australia, but it's always a bit cumbersome, right? There's a lot of people writing you, a lot of negotiation, you know how to price it. So sometimes I did it, oftentimes I didn't do it and stuff was just laying around it. Maybe at some point you would, you would throw it away. Twig made it uh, super simple and they actually had a lot of uh, fantastic, fantastic traction. They raised a series A also two years ago um, 35 million, um, and, um, really successful story. However, and this is, I think, always a bit of the downside when you bring in a venture capitalist, if you raise so much money, there's obviously also huge expectations in how fast you have to, you have to grow. And I think they had good traction. However, they didn't have the traction that their investors, um, expected. So, um, at some point they ran out of money. Again, that's typical if you're in this venture capital game, you run out of money. And then ideally your venture capitalist gives you more funding, but in this case, the venture capitalist said, well, it's a good business case, but it's not an excellent business case, and we're actually not gonna found the next round. So Twig, despite, in my point of view, being a very exciting business model, they they just went out of business. Um, I know the founders are right now looking in the US to found something very similar again, and let's see if they, if they have more success with this. But um, yeah, I still think a fascinating story in terms of business models, but also the, the challenges that are still, that are still out there. Now, hey, how are we doing with time? Just to give me some, I have to. Okay, fantastic. So we're good in time. Yeah. So um, let me now move a bit into what needs to happen to save companies such as Twig. And I have uh, outlined already kind of like this resource point, but I think there's a, there's a lot more. And let me start diving into this discussion uh, with this slide that's from a recent paper of mine that showcases what are the employee skills that you find in circular startups. So for this paper, uh, another PhD student of mine 
and I um, and a couple of other co-authors, we basically collected LinkedIn profile data for more than 4,000 people working in circular startups. And we ran a machine learning algorithm via all of this data to aggregate all of this data into what we call a skill taxonomy, right? And what you see here on this page is basically what came out of it. Um, basically the 40 most common skills you find in people that are working in circular startups. And here's actually the cut of circular startups where we said, and obviously there's always a bit of subjectivity involved with this, but where we said these are actually successful circular startups. So start circular startups that are kind of like still running, that seem to have market traction, that seem to raise sufficient funding, right? These are the kind of like um, top 40 skills. Two, three things that I think are worthwhile pointing out here and that are very different to the few papers that looked into these like skills for circular economy before most of these papers were very qualitative, basically just doing like 10, 15, 20 interviews. I think first one um, is a lot of these skills you probably also find in very conventional companies, right? Stuff like uh, research, stuff like out of the box thinking, there's nothing that's very circular about it. Still, I think it's a, it, it's a good insight that probably 80% of the skills that you need in a circular startup are exactly the same skills that you also need in any kind of a successful startup. Um, by the way, something that was not raised in the literature before. Second, we actually found there was a lot of digital skills also in all of these startups. I think, again, it makes intuitively a lot of sense, right? A lot of business models these days, no matter where you look, always have a digital element to it. But again, it was something the literature has not really picked upon before. But I think last but not least, um, we found this bucket of skills that are really, I think, unique to circular startups, which are these systems skills, right? In a sense, system building skills, uh, stuff like systems thinking, supply chain management, value chain collaboration, where we found that those startups that were particularly successful in terms of funding were actually also the startups that had most proficiency in these system skills, right? And I think coming back to my point, how do you save Twig? I think one of the things you always need to think about as a circular startup founder is what actually the skills I need in my company. So what are the capabilities I need to build up in my company in order to be successful? And this paper uh, tries to give a first indication of what direction one needs to walk into. Now, just building skills, um, for sure, um, is not enough, right? And um, a couple of uh, co-authors and mine, uh, Martin was again also involved in this special issue we did on this uh, term for business strategy environment. We said, well, um, isn't there a research stream needed in the circular economy literature that talks about what we called circular disruption? So what does circular disruption mean to us? It means a socio-technical system which causes the systemic widespread and fast change from the current economic model to one that's a lot more circular, right? And um, my colleagues and I, and I'll skip this slide, it's a beautiful visualization of this idea of how you get to a circular disruption. Do look at the paper if you're interested. But my colleagues and I, we basically looked into um, sustainability transitions literature, Rob's literature, and we um, tried to figure out from the literature like what needs to be in place um, in order for um, circular disruption to happen, right? And we put out seven elements. Um, one is business experimentation. So a lot of willingness to try out different things to do trial and error in order to get to a business model that works. Guidance of the search. So probably some kind of direction, maybe from policymakers, um, uh, maybe from industry associations of like, where is like, where's this entire story going? Knowledge development, knowledge diffusion. I think these are quite obvious. Market formation and deformation. I think public policy plays a, plays a huge role here. Resource mobilization for Twig, that was a very, very crucial, probably the most crucial point, but last but not least, also social and political mobilization. And with this, I also mean um, mobilization of consumers that up until today um, have always um, talked a lot about buying circular energy products. But if you then look how much they actually buy, there's still a massive data. Yeah. So circular disruption or circular disruption framework, something we put out there um, to yeah, try to at least outline the core buckets of, of what is needed to get faster to a circular economy. And once you are at a circular economy, I think one of the big questions still is, how does the circular economy actually look like, right? And um, here, and I'm just powering through here, here colleagues and I, we also wrote a paper that was called Circular Futures. What will they look like? Um, a thought experiment, essentially a paper we just sat down and thought about it. What are the what are the different options of a circular economy? I think that's also 
a much under researched question. Um, people always say circular economy, it's so obviously what it is. And, and they also tend to say circular economy once we're there, it's so obvious. But actually, what we outlined in this paper is that there's at least four different versions of how a circular economy could look like, and probably even more. These versions we organized from high tech to low tech, from centralized to decentralized, circular modernism, state plan circularity, bottom up sufficiency, and peer to peer circularity. We're basically in the different versions of the circular future. Also, different actors, different business models are dominant, right? Uh, state plan circularity, you could say it's kind of like the Chinese version of circularity where the government is kind of like leading the way. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer circularity, that's really where the consumers are leading the way and it's very regional, it's very local, right? So um, I think that's also something important to think about specifically when you're a policymaker, um, where do you even wanna end up in the day and the end when you say, I want a circular economy, what's your specific vision of the circular economy? Um, let, me, let me close with just a, few slides also on, on, on barriers of the circular economy. This is a slide also from my very first papers I wrote on circular economy, uh, which was around barriers to the circular economy. And what we looked at here across Europe, we built a huge data set as what's actually the largest barrier to the circular economy. And prior to our paper, a lot of people were saying, actually the main barrier here sits in the technological bucket. So we don't know how to solve uh, certain material efficiency questions. The engineers need to do more R&D. What came out of our research was that actually a lot of the technical elements, technical questions are solved or they're about to be solved, but that the biggest barrier is actually here, the cultural barriers, right? So the hesitancy of the consumers to actually spend their money on a product, even if that's at the same price point level than the linear product just because the consumer is such a routine animal right and um, tends to tends to always purchase what they what they always purchase i think an example i always like to share is think about the um, toothpaste brand that you've used for the last couple of years probably you have not changed it without thinking much about it. you've probably just used it for the last 10 15 years and even if there was now a circular version of the packaging, the new toothpaste brand coming up at exactly the same price, you probably stick to the original brand just because you always had and you never really considered it, right? So this again, to us, one of the um, core barriers um, up until today for the circular economy. Um, I think one of the most promising developments right now beyond these circular startups as an enabler is actually how many different countries out there have started to put policies in place that are supposed to accelerate the transition to the circular economy and to address the different barriers we've outlined from resource efficiency uh, also to uh, consumer barriers, right? And up until today, actually um, uh, more than 70 nations, uh, 71 since 2016, have launched roadmaps towards the circular economy. Uh, Germany also just launched its roadmap uh, during this uh, the summer. I was also allowed to give input for this roadmap uh, here and there. And I think we see that many of those roadmaps, and this is a piece of research also colleagues and I just put out very recently, many of these roadmaps um, focus very much on CE competitiveness. So they focus on tax modulation, on subsidy screams, on green public procurement, which I think are great levers to move towards the circular economy. They also focus a lot on minimizing leakage. However, when you look at it more holistically, um, there's still also a lot missing in many of these policy roadmaps, right? So everything that's read here is where both there's limited, limited research, but also where there's relatively limited policy action, right? So topics such as design and design requirements are something where we still don't see so much policy action. Um, something around production is also still something where uh, there's not so much. And we still, up until today, lack a lot of the tools to actually measure circular economy. Coming back to my initial point of what is the circular economy, if you can't even agree on a conceptual definition of the circular economy, obviously it's gonna be very, very difficult to align also on what's the one definition, right? So I think also in the policy realms, there's some good movement, but also still a lot to do when it comes to the circular economy. Now, let me, how many more minutes do I have me? I'm, I'm almost done. I can wrap up in 60 seconds. Yeah. Two more final slides here. The first one Rob uh, referred to. Um, I have been very active in the circular economy literature over the past couple of years. However, I've also been quite critical at times because I, we've now something like 35,000 papers, academic papers on circular economy. Um, I think, um, well, 
I would have expected that with these 35,000 papers, there's a lot more movement towards circularity. However, I felt that many of these papers actually don't contribute so much to the to the body of knowledge. And I, I wrote a parody, um, have a look at it uh, maybe later if you have not read it yet, um, about what's, what's wrong with the circular economy literature from people basically pursuing questions that have been pursued before to um, writing literature reviews of, of literature reviews. So basically reviewing something that has been reviewed many times before. Now, to end on a constructive note, I wrote um, a list of what are future research directions for the circular economy? What's the kind of research that I think would really help to translate a lot more of what we know about the circular economy in the realms of academia to um, the real world? And I'll not go through the full list, but let me just maybe pick my two, three uh, most um, uh, popular points. Um, number one, I think there's really a large need in the literature to move to medium and large N research. And right? I think this is also something we've seen in the sustainability transition literature. And um, it's always been very small N, which is, which is great, but obviously uh, that doesn't allow you to um, have sweeping conclusions um, oftentimes, right? So I think by now there's uh, so much happening. There's also so much funding in the literature that I think would be fascinating and would hopefully test some of our hypotheses from the qualitative research if we moved a lot more into this medium and large and in such. Second, I think it'd be wonderful to see a lot more research that actually goes very deep into specific sectors. We still see a lot of research, and um, I'm not innocent of that, that looks at circular economy at a very kind of like high level, like what is it? What does a circular future look like? And I think that's important research, but I think the research that oftentimes is most helpful for the practitioner is actually the research that very specifically for an industry sector says, what needs to happen to go circular. And uh, we've just launched a project at Utrecht University, for instance, Rob may know it, around circular hospitals, which I think is a fantastic example. Nobody has ever um, researched, I think, circular hospitals before. And this research project just wants to come up with a list of like 30 recommendations you as uh, someone heading a hospital can implement in order to make it a circular hospital. I think that's the kind of research that's very exciting. And I think last but not least, I think overall, I think there's sometimes a bit of uh, negativity now in the literature, but also among practitioners, uh, people saying, well, we've now researched so much about circular economy and people have been pushing it, but we still see so little movement. I think in a sense, uh, that's true, but for sure, I think it's not going to get better if we now just abandon the concept and move to the next magical concept. I think the only thing that, that will help here is if we keep the scholarly buzz alive, as I said it. So um, I do think that whereas not every paper that's coming out on circular economy is a paper I'm celebrating, I do think it's a fantastic thing that still so many papers come out. And I think uh, with more and more papers coming out, I think we'll also uh, continue to see progress in moving towards the circular economy. Thank you so much. Well done, Julian. Fantastic. You may keep standing here. If like yes, 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 yes. I'm sure yeah. it will pop up. Great presentation, great overview. It's great to see how you've sort of told the story from your start of this work in 2017 up until now and, you know, deep diving the startup uh, dynamics and putting that into a broader systems transformation uh, framework as well. So I think excellent, excellent talk um, and very promising to see what we will learn more tomorrow as well. We can have another uh, talk. Um, just want to open up the room for any, any questions um, or comments. Also, people online, please do let me know if you have a question uh, or a comment. Yeah. Um, do you want me to speak? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you very much, Julian, for the, for the talk. As, um, there are two elements that are sort of connected within the talk that I, and I was just wanting you to elaborate potentially a bit more. One of them was on the employee skills that you found within that, and particularly on the systems and systems creation, uh, and then linked up into, um, here's one, uh, I it was in the, um, I think it was in the startups where you saw that the embedding within the systems was so important. Um, is that a key point of failure that you saw within Twig that they were unable to engage within the wider systems that they're playing in? Or is that a barrier that you've seen in other circular businesses with the, the sort of the skill set existing within the employee profile, but then also the actioning of that? Yeah, yeah I think, um... <clears throat> I think, great question. I, I think in the case of Twig, I think my read on what went wrong uh, was fundamentally this barrier I mentioned, um, the, the cultural barrier. So basically the, the inability to excite uh, an amount of customers 
at the speed that was expected by their investors, right? And obviously you could say that the, like the, the lacking ability of convincing more consumers also has something to do with systems building. I think Twig was very successful in building the kind of like immediate system they were operating in, the operating model, these collaborations with UPS, et cetera. I think that was all working out uh, quite well. Um, but I think the kind of like the broader system, such as like policy interventions that could have maybe aided such a such a business model, I think that was in a sense also, well, there was lacking or they were not able to build it up at the at the right amount of speed, which then in the end resulted in this uh, lack of funding, right? And not enough funding uh, coming in. So I, I think, yeah, you could you could for sure say that also this like, um, yeah, that, that I think they did system building, but maybe not at the speed that was needed given the investors they had. Yeah. Um, yeah, so from my side, thank you very much for the, the amazing talk. Um, I have a very, very similar questions in a, in a way. Um, you talked about circular scale-ups, um, and it's something also we've seen like in Australia, that we have a lot of small startups with circular economy that are like reasonably successful, but really struggle to scale. Like in, in your experience with these companies, like what, what would you think are really, like what keeps circular um, startups from scaling? And also you said they they actually might um, scale worse than normal startups. Like what's your hypothesis on, on what is the case? Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, so I think, again, I'm coming back to the, to the consumer, I'll do a bit of consumer bashing. There's a lot of great research um, out there on routines of consumers, right? And, and one of the findings is that the average consumer in the Western world has around 150 products they consume per year. And these products actually stay surprisingly stable over a 10 year period, right? So the 150 products, 150 brands you consumed 10 years ago will be very similar to today, right? And even if um, there's a new product in the market that has a much better um, uh, environmental footprint, but the same price, consumers have so many things they think about, they will not switch, right? So the challenges, if you wanna break into a market um, as, a, as a startup, you actually have to offer something that's like at a much, cheaper price and or at a, at a much better utility. And I think a problem we've seen with many of the products that circular startups have put out is that oftentimes the, the price has been higher. Utility has been the same. Sometimes utility and price was the same, but that's just not enough for people to make the jump. Let me give one concrete example, which is Fairphone, right? Um, great company example, circular um, scale up, you'd say. Um, even I, as a circular company researcher, don't use a Fairphone. I still have an iPhone. And why is that the case? Because the Fairphone, in terms of functionality, probably is still worse than an iPhone. And in terms of um, price, it's also not making so much of a difference, right? So I think there's a, yeah, I, I think the many of the circular startups I've seen have not been able to innovate their product radically enough to really convince these lazy routine consumers including me to actually make the jump right and i think that's a that's a i think that's a that's a core reason why we've seen way too limited scaling yeah. thanks julian i got another question but i want to first go to online so people can participate yep. jason go ahead hi thanks so much for that i hope you can hear me um i'm just coming in from samoa who's dealing with a bit of a ecological crisis at the moment a question for you. I'm really interested in funding models with early stage circular. What to what extent did Twig's $35 million cash injection? To what extent was the funding model? That's what kind of doomed it because in that VC world, you need an exit in three to five years. Is that a big contributor? And so the next question is: Is therefore we need new funding models? Yeah. Um, I mean, I alluded to it a bit in the talk. I I also think that in a sense the decision to go into traditional venture capital contributed to the demise of Twig, right? I think that's fair to say. And I, have a, mm -hmm. I mean, I live in Berlin. I have a lot of friends who like have their own startups. Uh, some are circular, some are conventional. And many share that um, they think very critically about their decision to bring in venture capital. Right? Because the moment you bring in venture capital, um, you bring in kind of like a machine that is just incentivized for like massive, extremely aggressive growth, right? And um, I think that's the kind of growth venture capital envisages is very tricky oftentimes to achieve for a conventional startup, but it's probably even more tricky to achieve for a business model that also needs to 
um, kind of like change a bit the kind of like cultural environment, right? So I think there is a mismatch between how venture capital looks at circularity startups and how these startups actually function. I think there would be need for more patience oftentimes, um, patience these venture capitalists frequently don't have. So I, I, I fully agree that that um, is also a contributing factor and that if you are a circular um, startup, you need to very carefully think about who's gonna fund you and then obviously who's also gonna, gonna, gonna push you. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Amrik? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turn on the mic. Turn the mic on. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Julian. Um, a couple of quick questions. One is, um, can you talk a little bit more about the barriers? I'm really interested in barriers to implementation because in your first talk, part of the talk, where you uh, did your literature review, you focused on core principles, aims, and enablers. What does the literature say about barriers? And the second one, uh, to do with emerging economies as your suggested future research focus. Um, Glenn and I are visiting you know, India and, and countries like Sri Lanka and so on, where you know, they are resource constrained anyway. They've been used to you know, making use of scarce resources for you know, decades. There's very little sort of waste in, in you know, you still go to, uh, Glenn and I went to New Delhi to the old Delhi area where you can still find products made 50 years ago and parts and products still available. So they're used to all of that. My question is really what sort of research do you think we should focus on in the emerging economies? Yeah, I think two uh, fantastic questions. Um, I think I would have touched upon both of them if I had had uh, more time towards the end of my talk. Uh, so let me just pull up two slides again that give at least partial answers. I start with your second question. Um, nine future research directions. Point number seven, more work on emerging economies. A couple of years ago, I looked into the literature and I looked into the percent of papers actually covering circular economy in emerging economies. It was 4.5%. Um, it may be slightly more today, but it's for sure still very, very little. And uh, I think that's a huge problem because as you've also alluded to, I think many emerging economies are actually um, a lot more circular if you think about the core principles than the Western world. And I think actually there's so much we can learn from how consumers in these countries also uh, live their everyday lives with products so that we can maybe also incorporate in the in the Western world. I'm doing one project right now with collaborators in India. We look into um, circularity in the textile sector. And even though there's very limited regulation, just because people have to, I'd say um, they're a lot more circular in their textiles consumption than anyone here in Australia or in, or in Germany, right? So I think that's a huge research area where I would love to see research that really says, well, what can we learn from these emerging economies that we've forgotten in the Western world, right? So that on your on your second question. On your first question on the, on the barriers, I mean, I only touched briefly upon it, but typically the literature distinguishes between four types of barriers. And there's a lot of debate on like which of these barriers are truly the most pressing ones. Uh, there's, there's one, uh, yeah, if you put the slide up here, the bigger again, there's one um, that are the cultural barriers. There's one that are the regulatory barriers that are one that are kind of like the market barriers and one that's, uh, those are technology barriers. And the way um, I suggest in the paper to think about this is a bit as a, as a nested structure, right? So in the sense you can say, well, um, if, if you don't overcome the technological barriers, all other barriers don't matter, right? Because you need the technological barriers in order to even put out a product, right? And then once you have this product, you can try to kind of like build a market with this product. The regulatory environment then will kind of like set the, boundaries for these markets so that also needs to be in place and once all of that is in place you still need to kind of like convince the consumers right so it's, it's almost kind of like a chain reaction of of barriers you can say where first you have to kind of like you have to cut through the technological ones you have to build the market regulation needs to be in place that's okay and then you have to convince the consumers um as i said much of the literature for a couple of years and i think the perspective is changing now has basically said in this kind of like chain reaction almost we are here at the very kind of like first chain. So we're stuck with like, we don't even have the technological solutions, right? So people were saying to make it a bit more concrete, um, it's not possible to do a shoe that's coming out of 100% recycled materials. So, I mean, Adidas, for instance, has shown us that actually is possible. There's uh, kind of like, you, you can create some kind of market. There's even some kind of like regulatory support. But then again, and that was my core point in the paper, uh, as I said now many times, I think the 
like the, the main issue is that the segment of consumers that's truly green, that's truly willing to pay a premium for circularity, that's truly willing to consider if they're buying a green product versus a conventional product, that is still way too small, even in markets that have a relatively high awareness of these topics in, in Europe. And I think from what I heard from the initial talks we had here, Martin, it's even much, much more uh, smaller, this green segment of consumers in, in Australia, right? So I think that's something where, if you think about barriers, I think that's a, I think that's a fundamental barrier where I think it's interesting to think about and where I think you guys are, Stefan, great to see you again, doing some great work again with like behavioral work, right? And what are um, interventions you can do to convince consumers um, to, to change their behavior? Yeah. Thanks, Julian. I think we've got another question on online. Yeah, who is that? Ah, oh, Mitzi, go ahead. Thanks, Ron. Hope everyone can hear me. Thanks very much for your talk, Julian. It was great. I have pages and pages of notes. Um, one question that kind of sticks out for me is I was brought up as a cynic. So you talked about magic and uh, sort of resulting in disillusionment. Um, I would say, sorry to Harry Potter fans, magic isn't real. It's trickery. So what's to stop the disillusionment, disillusionment in the circular economy coming to fruition when we realise that actually it takes a significant amount of work to enable, including the kind of cultural and paradigm shift that you've been talking to. And I guess the follow-up aspect of that is with those different circular futures, was one or other sort of less magic and perhaps therefore more realistic in terms of us being able to enable it? Now that's my question. Thanks very much. Yeah, Mitzi, I think fantastic questions. Um, I, I think actually when I look at the circular economy literature, but also circular economy in practice, my sense is that we're um, approaching a tipping point, kind of like a make or break point, because we've had now roughly 10 years of bus, right? I think Circular Economy really started taking off around 2014 with all of these Ellen MacArthur Foundation reports. And um, there's a lot of bus, but compared to the buffs, not so much movement, right? So I think we all hear more and more this criticism of exactly as you've said, Mitzi, that uh, the magic is fake, right? And, and I see the great threat of um, uh, this concept being abandoned and all of us just jumping on the next sustainability buzzword bandwagon. I think that's a, that's a real risk, right? Um, what needs to happen in order for that not to happen? Uh, I think a bunch of things, and this list is probably now incomplete. I, I think number one, really different kind of research, much, much more applied research. My example with like the circular hospitals, I think that's the kind of research that actually makes it less hard to implement the circular economy. No more papers on 221 definitions, if I may say so, right? So I think that's number one. I think number two, much, much more aggressiveness from policymakers in creating markets for circularity. And I think also here, like we see a lot of the roadmaps and I didn't have time to touch about it, to touch upon it. But here you see of all of those countries that have put out their roadmaps, 27 are at like level call to action, 30 are at the stage of roadmap, only 18 out of the 75 countries are actually operational strategies. So that's obviously way too few. And even if you look into those 18 operational strategies, Mitzi, I'd say the policies in there are not aggressive enough, right? And I think some policies are actually quite easy and they would make life for a lot of circular startups out there so much easier, but, but um, there, there's a lot of vested interests that I think result in these policies not being implemented. Let me just give one or two examples. I think one example is, for instance, um, policies around uh, recycled content, right? It's very easy to just say that from now on, um, every uh, yogurt cup out of plastic needs to have 70% recycled content in there, right? You can just kind of like write that as one sentence in your legislation, and it creates a huge market suddenly for recycled plastics and a lot of opportunity for, for startups in there. Uh, we're not seeing these kinds of regulation. Um, you could say, and some countries such as Sweden have done it, everything that's a reused product gets a 0% VAT um, and used uh, new products get 20, 25% VAT. Again, would be a great unfair advantage for, for circularity. Um, you could say when it comes to public procurement, um, public sector actually in almost every country in the Western world is the largest purchases, purchaser of goods and services, right? So that's a huge lever you have to pull. Um, the public sector, most of the time, purely purchases based on price, right? So it always purchases what's the cheapest. It would be very easy for the public sector to say, we actually give an advantage to a product um, that can prove that it's circular. And even if it's 30% more expensive, 
if it's circular, we'll take it. I think this would create huge markets from one day to the other for, for these circular startups, right? So I think these maybe Mitzi just as like two answers, so different kind of research, but I think even more important, much, much more aggressive policy making that I think could truly then lead to what we call this like circular disruption. Huh? Thanks, Thank Shilin. I wanted to follow up with a question on that one, but we run out of time. So I'm asking over lunch. Everyone else who wants to hear it should join us for lunch. Um, thank you so much. That has been a great uh, and excellent talk. Um, thanks for coming over to Melbourne. I know this is not the only thing you're doing, but still it's uh, quite uh, far of a trip. Uh, thanks everyone for joining here as well. And uh, if you just a reminder, if you still want to join for the affiliates event tomorrow, please do reach out to me or May and we can register for you for the online participation as well. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much.